All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Timothy Gager, and this is Virtual Friday Dire Literary Series. And my feature tonight is a wonderful poet. You know, uh, looking forward to hearing his work and chatting with him a little bit later, um, Major Jackson. So uh, let me uh, let me see what I got here for our bio. Since uh, there we are. Since I don't. See, when you're the MC, you get to read a lot of these bios. So instead, I just put them up so you read them. But, but you know, to paraphrase, uh, there's quite a lot of accomplishments to take a look at. Uh, I guess the first one to look at is Major has a book that he released in 2020 that you all should check out. Um, he's edited Best American Poetry 2019. Um, that's another highlight. I get that um, every single year. Um, you know, just a few minor things, uh, fellowship and fine arts work center in Provincetown, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Um, he actually, um, this is a bio that someone has actually been awarded a Pushcart Prize and uh, a Whiting Writers Award. But as you can see, um, those are just words in a bio. So I'm very, very honored and pleased to announce um, the man, Major Jackson. Thank you, Timothy. And thank you for not reading all of those words. It can get pretty embarrassing at this moment in my life um, <clears throat> to hear all that. I love the introduction that he's a poet. That's pretty much what I heard there. And I appreciate that. Um, I have a computer that has no power cord right now. And I, I drove to, I'm en route back to Vermont. And I stopped at a, uh, at a hotel and asked them if they had a spare Dell power cord. And they said, yes. And so it's charged, but I'm not sure how much charge there is, but I'm, it's pretty funny. There's other narratives to, to my day that I, I'll spare you. Um, in the spirit of the Dyer reading series, and thank you, Timothy, for the introduction, I mean, the, uh, the invitation, um, I get a sense of community and history uh, with the series, and I'm honored to be a part of it. So I'm going to read some new poems and a few poems from the absurd uh, man, I'm going to start off with um, this poem. Please correct me, someone. You know this painting. This is an ekphrastic poem. You know this painting. It features, um, it's in uh, the Louvre, Love, Louvre. And uh, it, it features two men fully dressed. in the woods having a picnic with a woman who's nude. And in the background is a woman who looks like she could be a classical Greek goddess washing herself, bathing. The déjeuner, de de. Someone correct me, I feel like my, my French is, is reverted to high school. Anyway, I thought of that that um, painting and was thinking about the model that uh, I think it's Manet, is the same woman who's actually in his other paintings, Olympia. Anyway, it occurred to me that most likely she's the model and who's also bathing. And, 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 it, and it also occurred to me that most scholars have read it as two women and it's possible that just the just the scene, the light around it, it could be a projection of herself, her seeing herself bathing. And it's written in her voice. Late summer, canopy lanes greener today, light shafting a hole in dense foliage, wide enough to spotlight an impromptu stage where I rest as nature makes way for our ritual tiffin of Roquefort bread and grapes. Bored 
with men's chatter, I disrobe, and still they drone like professors. I have a mind to make a bed of this patch of earth or the skiff that carried us over. Where might their eyes wander then? They pretend not to see what so makes me human, skimming past my words like my body. Leanhoff's hand suggestive at my back lingers, waiting for something to jump off. I have a mind to strike our tangled legs awake with the other's cane. We are all digits and lopsided triangles. I want to inhabit my own domain, a canvas of one. Nymph-like, I picture myself ankle deep, bathing in forest water, unconcerned of their attention. No, I want to be heard. Okay, that's poem one. Thank you, thank you, very kind. And this is a poem that um, takes place, no, I won't read that. Here's a poem called Cancelled, a phenomenon of early 21st century, um, controversial though it may be, maybe a necessary uh, juncture in our lives for balancing power. Social media is really fascinating in that regard. Um, unfortunately, I think in some cases, the cancel culture is dead on and calling out bad behavior. And then other cases, there might be victims or what do you call it? Um, collateral collateral damage, canceled. Something like cupping your testes in order to cough. Something like working overtime since you're not the boss or charged with murder absent a sound alibi or awful yet, you did the crime. All the platforms televise your demise. What was once your plinth is now a coffin. The tweets are there when you step outside, shocked to learn how the mighty have fallen. Trending is a stubborn word for the problem won't go away. You said a racial slur. You didn't he, him, his. You were caught too often in other people's fashions and never giving credit. Now you are growing stubble in a pitch black cavern. No one cares you're dying a million hashtag daggers. You probably heard that was a sonnet and it was written after I read that Justin Bieber took it on the chin for wearing dreads, for wearing dreads and not acknowledging the culture of Rastafarianism that gave us such a fashion. Okay, that's a new poem. Here's another new poem. I guess it's about aging and sometimes we find ourselves maybe where once we figured something out we found ourselves back facing the same dilemma then you go to therapy and then you go to therapy again all along i thought my mind would arc, arc. All along, I thought my mind would arc like an Olympic diver off the platform of my years towards some deep pool of clarity and wisdom. 
cutting quick through the body of my problems without making a splash. Techniques of coping learned after endless trials of mishaps and blunders. But lately, my tilts and flips, my pikes and tucks after surveying spring and height, the way to lean my shoulders into spins and reverse somersaults have left me lately flummoxed and frayed. I'm either la 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 or stuck probing, shampooing my head in the swarming froth, massaging solutions. I have forgotten how to pull the lobe of my ear and wink at an audience or handle it like a boss. What omen is this that at midlife I'm as confused as my teen years? Some say it's about the journey, man. True, I'm addicted to the scenery and I have nothing to prove. But come on, do I have to restart all the time where I begin? Goofy, funny poems, I'll say. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Thank you, kind people. Okay. I'm gonna read some poems from uh, The Absurd Man, which published just before the pandemic, February 25th, 2020 to be exact. Um, and I've read a lot in these settings, in Zoom settings. And there's some poems I've read at least um, 50 or more times. So I'm going to try and read some poems I haven't read. I've said too much. I've said too much. The soil overruns with honey. Porch lights blaze into the afternoons. I find it difficult to control my idioms. Only ask which direction the wind blows and I will give you a history of my elms in cottonwoods or my theft of fire. My brain plunders its orchid of speech. Watch the expressiveness stains at the corners of my mouth, dark as blueberries, blossom into a symphony. I am too far from the land of hush to be useful. What is said must be said, so I say it. Inheritor of hieroglyphs and cave drawings, I keep the engines of hearsay fueled, an echo of the ancients, especially the sophists. Leave me with your griefs and barefoot secrets and rest assured, I will secure your memory and your name. The tremble of a wave heading to shore will ricochet back into the deep sea of my sayings and bewilderments. Provide a backdrop of cheese and tapenades with a little Sauvignon from the Sederberg Mountains and you can have a lifetime of a constellations as you take in the great stone core at the Acropolis of Major, unyielding and slanting light, which is how the light is hitting me right now. I think that took care a little bit of it. <clears throat> Here is a new poem. Um, it's called, Let Me Begin Again. And it's about starting over. Okay. Let me begin again. Let me begin again as a quiet thought in the shape of a shell, slowly examined by a brown child on a beach at dawn, straining to see her future. Let me begin this time knowing the drumming of my dreams is me inheriting the earth, 
is morning lighting up the rivers. Let me burn my vanities, old music in the pines, sifters of scotch, a day moon like a signature of night. This time, let me circle the island of my fears only once and then live like a raging waterfall and grow a magnificent mustache. Let me not ever be the birdcage or the serrated blade or the empty season. Dear glacier, dear sea of stars, dear leopards disintegrating at the outer limits of our greed, soon we will encounter you only in motivational tweets. Reader, I should have married you sooner. This time, let me not sleep like the prophet who believes he's seen infinity. Let me run at breakneck speeds towards sceneries of doubt. I have no more dress rehearsals. Look closer. I am licking my lips. Gracias, muchas, muchas gracias. Okay. Um, like I said, I'm going to try and read poems I don't read too often. And please, uh, yeah, I'll read this one. My children's inheritance. My children's inheritance. Because what else am I going to leave them? Poems and more poems. <clears throat> a fancy for high green hills by a sea, baggy spaces in the day, a knack for gunpowder thinking a library humming like a swarm of gnats, the intrigue of a woman with a pitch perfect mind, blinking eyes whose silence is, a, is ancient and naked, a grave which is not a grave, but a ruin to visit in middle age. A shiver robe of half empty cologne bottles in various colors and dried flowers more dignified in death, both evidence that I once cherished bouquets and timelessness. Bullet casings, a bolt, the list goes on. Bullet casings, a bowl of seashells, fine pins, one, the Aurora Diamante with its two-toned rhodium plating that glitters when my right hand rages toward heaven. A love of big plates of pasta, Argentinian folk music, African rainforest and the speeches of Lincoln that miss the pages of my books more than my doorways. A habit of dancing when the needle drops a disregard for the enemies of linnets and macaws, fears that match the hawk haunted buttes out west, a hard desire for justice. The habit of lip biting when trouble nears, the way my mouth opens like a flower, my quiver of arrows that outweighs the world, leaving the animals to bear witness. Memories of laughter that was bread and water. Stylish hats, ways to time travel, the consequences of mistakes and second thoughts come to the future. A collection of radios, stacks of vinyl, the limitations of secrets, long nights that cascade like waterfalls, my madness, granular and complex sealed like a footfall. Okay, maybe, maybe, <clears throat> maybe uh, three more poems. Now that you are here, I can think. Now that you are here, I can think. The mainland of your feelings a young Veronica Webb, 
and what we share are solutions. And not so much the Parisian air you tired of, nor the sweaty bead coursing a decolletage, an unlikely consequence of the Kyoto Protocol, but the pleasures of lounging below French style windows open wide as arms, whose blousy curtain is a shawl that formally hangs and informally shifts when you drift into the room like a spikely dolly shot. The kids are dancing to some Ariana, but I'm watching what you do with your lips when reading silently around 4.22 p.m. on a late Sunday afternoon. I have a weakness for marble winding stairs and tight two-person brasseries, I'm sorry, and tight two-person elevators, but the brasseries are waiting as well as the football fans who need help cheering, for we are Americans after all, and are ready to hype even the locusts on the day of judgment. I don't care about the midfielder or the winger. You're smiling, and that's all the defending I'll ever need. Oldie, but goodie, as we say. Okay, I said three more, so that was two. And here is the next one. And it's called um, Double View of the Adirondacks as reflected over Lake Champlain from Waterfront Park, which is in Burlington. The mountains, I'm not sure, well, you know, you've seen the Adirondack Mountains at, at some point, I hope. The mountains are at their theater again, each ridge practicing an oration of scale and crest. And the sails performing glides across the lake complain for being outshadowed despite their gracious vows. 13 years in this state, what hasn't occurred? A cyclone in my spirit led to divorce. Four books gave darkness an echo of control. My slurred hand finding steadiness by the prop of a page and God, my children whom I scarred, pray they forgive. My crimes felt mountainous, yet perspective came with distance. And like those peaks, once keening beneath biting ice, then felt resurrection in a vestige of water, unfrozen, cascading and adding to the lake's depth, such have I come to gauge my own screaming. The mass tips so far, they appear to capsize, keeling over where every father is a boat on water. The wakes carry the memory of battles and the Adirondacks hold their measure. I am a tributary of something greater. Last poem, people. Thank you, thank you. Okay, let's see. Uh, so part of Timothy's introduction um, compelled me to read this poem, and it features another poet, Matthew Dickman, who um, Matthew and I, uh, whenever I drive, he and I get stopped by police, and we've been stopped no less than seven times, I must say, all across the country. Uh, so one wants to write something that maybe serves as a kind of sage burning, you know, in the world, um, a ritual poem. The Romantics of Franconia Notch. Matthew Dickman and I are fond of resurrecting the spotted faces of state troopers and small town police we've met over the years. 
We love their melodrama, the way they peel their aviators in the rear view of my Jetta as they approach the car like a shy teenager on a first date, then doff their stiff brim hats with yellow braids. There was the pastel loving cop in Eugene, fond of art deco motels in South Beach, and the comic book fan in Littleton, New Hampshire, who unlatched his gun holster, and the one tormented by Goethe's propositions and thus led us choral-like through a few hymns before issuing a roadside warning in Randolph, Vermont. When they ask us, where are we going? We almost always respond to the town square, of course, to give the park back to the wretched men and their brown bags of sorrow and needles, which turned them to black puddles. We want the crime squad to know we have a purpose, that we sugar our hopes with the honey lines of Brodsky and Pessoa and Thoreau, whom we were declaiming just that moment, zipping in the dark past low-lit colonials, when a black bear jumped out as though chased by the ghost of the bear he used to be. And Matthew turned up Jay-Z's Black Album so he'd get a boost and lurch into further darkness. Thank you all for listening to those poems. Very kind. Wow, thank you, Major. What a fantastic uh, reading. Our first question is, how's your battery life there? Are you, you gonna hang with us here or are you gonna get shut down? I'm gonna stay as long as this computer will allow. Thank right, you, well, I'm looking forward to hearing everyone. So fantastic. So you said uh, you're over in Nashville now, which is the, the music capital of the world. Um, John Westick says there's a lot of Zoom poetry readings out of, out of Nashville. So is the poetry scene in Nashville just as big as the music scene? One wishes, right? It would be, uh, it, it, it would be uh, a mecca of sorts of, of uh, deep feeling, uh, music, sound, lyric. But I will say, having only been there under, um, coming up on six months, uh, what a joyous uh, legacy of poets, uh, both from the past and being carried forward with the poets who are there. So um, even though it, it may seem small, comparatively, um, the poets from that part of the world have kind of enriched our, uh, our, our American legacy of, of literature. So uh, Barbara wants to know the name of the poem you read on aging and uh, what inspired it? And is it in the book Absurd Man? No, it's not. It's a new poem, uh, like really new. And uh, I'll probably edit it a little bit more and hopefully it'll be in the, in the next book. What inspired it was um, uh, not any particular moment except for the fact that I am finding myself in a new community, negotiating a new environment, landscape, um, and just contemplating my journey and realizing so much of, of life is addressing the questions that have plagued us for a long time. Now, speaking of some of those questions, Absurd Man is kind of, it's a theme about absurdism, which is Camus, Camus which I went into a whole uh, rabbit hole of philosophy geekness today, which I loved. But uh, did you write to that theme or when you were putting together the poems for this book, did you find that it was, you were heading toward absurdism natural, naturally? So in other words, is it nature or nurture going on here? A little bit of both. Um, someone recently, as part of an introduction, went into my earlier books and saw this through line, this thread of me speaking back to philosophers. And as you know, um, 
one of the big three cast us out of his ideal republic throughout the, the poets. And I think subconsciously, we're all in to some, some extent claiming ground and, and territory. There's, a, there's so much, as Keats says, beauty and truth um, in poetry. And I think we want to kind of claim some of that. My, my, with this particular book, it's, it's chiefly owed to the fact that someone I dearly love um, experienced the loss of a partner or spouse to suicide and suicide was a very central theme in Camus, the myth of Sisyphus. And I remember that opening paragraph uh, in that book. And when we became uh, partners, I returned to that book and realized that um, the existential questions that I that have plagued me again for a long time now um, I've been I've been walking towards swimming towards uh, for a long time and and so in the construction of the book I did think about how I could frame what I've already been writing about uh, which is how how do we come to make sense of our journey here on earth. Um, particularly if one, like, you know, I, I grew up in the church, but I'm also equally informed by all of the literature and art and music that I've encountered. Has it lessened, and it has lessened, it's given me solace to be both a writer and someone who believes in the centrality of, of human expression. So, yeah, I, I very much, thank you for that question, Tim. I very much saw the book, The Absurd Man, as a more deliberate architecture that wants to occupy that space. All right, and uh, with, with that also, I mean, part of the philosophy is it's embracing the absurd condition of human nature. And it's not necessarily absurd, like wacky and crazy. It's kind of the right. meaning of life versus the lack of meaning of life. But, you know, if you were writing these poems from 2016 to 2020, do you feel you had plenty of material there? It's very good. Very, very good question. In fact, a friend of mine who's a poet, um, I would say maybe a little bit more of a poet of social critique, uh, a political poet. Uh, when she heard the title of my book, she instantly thought um, the 45th president. And, oh, that's the absurd man. And I would say, oh, I wish I was that, that imaginative um, to have thought of that, but I welcome I welcome the the interpretation of these spot, these poems as a response to the moment that we're living. Who has not been shaken out of their relative comfort of we've made great political progress in this country? Um, so there's there's something about the level of nostalgia that comes with it, I think a disregard for humans that um, we saw with the last administration that made it okay to be anti-Semitic, made it okay to be um, anti-woman, a woman's body is for grabbing, that made it okay to be racist or to valorize a history of Disregard, I'm just going to say that anti humanism, anti life. Uh, I'm going to jump to when you edited Best American Poetry. Here's a good chance to get some good plugs in for your friends, but you don't have to. I'll, I'm, when you edited that volume of, of great poetry, did you learn of any new poets that, you know, just sort of became like almost go tos? Uh, yes, I did. And 
I'm I'm sorry my my brain is so full of the of the days, but there's there's a poem in there entitled Hashtag Me Too. That particular poet was uh, new to me, um, and I wouldn't say go to because so much of my vision for that volume was to get people in dialogue, particularly younger poets, um, in dialogue with um, uh, uh, some of the some of the biggest lights of, of our, our particular moment. So I'm waiting to see, right? Um, yeah, there, there's, I think, Rebecca Lindenberg, whose work I knew of, of course, but um, gosh, her poem, I think, is so important right now, enormously important as we contemplate the, the fate of the environment, our inability to pay attention. I mean, as a result of technology, like, yeah, it's, a, it's a good. Thank you for, for that question, too. Now, you said that you and uh, Matthew have been pulled over no less than seven times, and I might not have gotten pulled over seven times in my life. So if you're writing a poem about that, about being excessively pulled over, um, do you write it when you're kind of pissed off or feel unjust about it, or do you write it when it, your feelings about it settle down? It occurred to me that in three of the five books of poetry I've written over the past almost two decades, I have at least one poem in every volume about being uh, racially profiled. I did not know it. I didn't have the language back then for it, but I had the experience. The, one of the poems takes place in Hayes, Kansas and appears in my first book and is part of, I think is part of the Urban Renewal series. And um, that one was written as the policeman was writing up my ticket. Like I started that poem right there in the car. I was driving cross country to Oregon to go to graduate school. And frankly, I was speeding. Uh, did you but, tell them that poem was just a warning? This poem is just yeah. a warning. <laughs> and what was fantastic about that moment was, uh, well, what, what wasn't fantastic was the, the exchange, which I didn't put in the poem. But the fact of the matter is I knew that poem needed, I needed to, I needed to get it out at that moment. That writing that poem maybe saved me from it maybe maybe kept me alive in a way because I could direct that energy of frustration. Um, another poem I call Pest references at the time he was the senator from Delaware. I now he's our our president, but I, I mentioned the senator from Delaware. Anyway, the crumbling of a nation, I, if I remember what that poem, remember that poem, but um, no, I don't write it. And even with Matthew, it was a series of revisiting. Remember that time when we were driving after a night at the bar and that cop pulled you over? And always, you know, if you know Matthew, he's far more charming than I could ever be. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we suddenly learn about cops' passions, you know, what, what are their hobbies? And that's included in the poem, you know, in the sly ways, you know, the, the, the pastel loving cop, i.e. who loves to go to Miami. I think that was an exchange. Anyway. We have a frozen, I hope his power just didn't go. So I had, I had a great question. Let's see what we can do for a few seconds seconds here. Do people freeze when their battery power ends? Well, I might give it five more seconds or 10 more seconds, because this is a wonderful uh, reading by Major Jackson and also his uh, 
questions and answers were pretty fabulous as well. Um, uh, maybe when he comes back, well, we can just thank him. But I think I'm going to sign off on the live Facebook because that's kind of what we're doing, unless he comes back. But um, I'm going to sign off and I'll thank everybody for being on the Facebook Live and, and thank Major for uh, being here to present that to you. So uh, let me uh, shut off the live stream.